Hello, welcome to the beginning of chapter three. Well, basically, we're going to take everything we did last chapter, which was movement in straight lines, left and right, or up and down, and we're going to do both simultaneously. We're going to go to two dimensions, and theoretically three dimensions, because three dimensions will follow the same logic, but we're not really going to touch on it too much. But basically, we are just going to do the same motion equations, the same kinematic equations. They're just, in fact, all of the equations this chapter, with a very, very minor exception, are those exact same kinematic equations. Just now we're going to talk about how to deal with them two-dimensionally. Um, however, before I can do that, I need to make sure everyone is completely on the same page with trigonometry. And so I did a little bit of trig in chapter one, but I'm going to talk a lot more trig for the hunk of today. And this is going to be a everything you should have learned in a trig class if it was required, um, but enough to get through this. So math, as I said in last chapter, is that physical quantities are always going to be a vector or a scalar. I'm just going to make these all pop up while I fix clean my glasses. A vector is something that has both size and magnitude. It's not enough to say five meters, it's five meters in what direction. A scalar is something that has only magnitude and does not include direction. Now it's worth pointing out, well, okay, before I get into worth pointing out, for, we're basically just gonna be talking about vectors this chapter again. And so all the terms we're gonna talk about, be them position, velocity, acceleration, Really, those are the three big ones. I don't think we're going to talk about any other terms this angle, but that's part of position. So yeah, position, velocity, acceleration, that's what we're going to talk about this chapter, are all going to be vectors. So we're going to have to s talk about them in terms of their direction and their magnitude. And before last chapter, where I could just say, hey, is it to the right or to the left? Is it this way? Or is it this way? Now we're going to start doing two dimensional. So now I have things going that way. And it's going to become a little more complicated. You know, I'm going to zoom in a little bit more here. So on that note, with the it's getting a little more complicated. The first thing I'm going to introduce is the equality of two vectors. The magnitude is part of a vector. Two vectors are only considered equal when both their magnitude and their direction is the same. These two vectors have the exact same length. This right here is two equal vectors. But this is not. Even though these vectors have the same length, they are not equal vectors because they have different directions. The direction is an important part. And we can only say two vectors are equal when they have the same length and the exact same direction. That being said, if you multiply a, ve a vector by a negative symbol, and there's going to be a lot of me going back and forth and trying to re-put this in the front. Like if I take, if this is my, let's match the colors. I used blue here. If I take vector A and I multiply vector A by negative one, I get that. When you multiply a vector by a negative, what that does is it twists the vector 180 degrees. That any vector times negative one is just the vector's direction flipped. And so I can just take this vector and say, OK, if this vector, if I multiply it by negative one, I get that vector. Same length, opposite direction. And we're going to use that a bit. Now, the other thing you're going to have to get ready for is what happens when we add vectors. You see, if I want to add two numbers, so if I say like 4 plus 3, OK, 4 plus 3, that's 7. You can do it. But if I want to add two vectors, and let me grab some other sizes, it's a little more complicated. Because if I want to add this vector and this vector, I can be like, well, I can add the magnitudes. But this direction is important. If I were to add these two vectors, I need to include that direction. Anytime you want to add two vectors, if you have your hands on some graph paper and things like that, the basis for adding vectors is something called the tip to tail method. If I want to add these two vectors, what I'm going to do 
is I'm going. Oh, you can't see what I'm using. <laughs> Let me make this pop up. Sorry, that was on the screen. If I want to add these two vectors, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my first vector and just put it there. Take my second vector and so, so the end of it starts at the tip of the first one. And the resultant vector, which in this case is my red one, is just going to be the magnitude and direction of where I started to where I ended up. When you want to add two vectors, yeah, that's how it's going to be. You're going to just not add the magnitudes. You can't just add the magnitudes. But if you're going to graphically do it, and we're going to get into out, I'm not going to expect you to draw with protractors and rulers every time we're adding vectors. We'll get into a mathematical way in a little bit. But what you're going to do when you want to add two vectors is it's going to be the sum of the magnitude and the directions, drawing them tip to tail. So I, as in the tip of this one goes to the tail of that one. And wherever we started to wherever we ended up, that is the resultant vector. Um, and that's how you do it. If you want to know the magnitude and direction of my resultant vector, in this case, the red one, I would, what was, that was weird. What I would do is I would just measure the length and the angle of it. If you ever need to add more than two vectors, you just keep drawing them tip to tail. If I want to add all three of these vectors, I'd say, okay, and I'll just pick a direction. Sure, I went, nah, that's a little too. If I want to add these three vectors, I would just put this one to here and then move this one to the end, which I know is off the cam. Never mind, the camera's not visible. I have to remember that every time I go to the next slide, it disappears. So, yeah, if I want to add these three vectors, I would just tip to tail, tip to tail, tip to tail, and I know I'm off the end. And I would just draw a line from the beginning point to the ending point. You can also see it in the right side of the screen. That's how you're going to add vectors graphically. Now it is of note, um, the addition of vectors does follow the commutative law of addition. A plus B equals B plus A. That this right here, if I switch the order, and I'm going to kind of swap the colors to display that. I kind of separate what you can see. But if I do this guy, then that one, that's the same as this guy plus that one. But it doesn't matter the order you add the vectors. As you can see, that they both went to the same spot in the end. Um, that is not necessarily true for multiplication of vectors. In, in algebra, you can add things in any order, you can multiply them in any order. In vectors, you can add in any order and multiply. You sometimes can and sometimes can't. Multiplication of vectors is very complicated. It involves things called cross products and dot products. We are not going to cover that. That is a calc level topic, um, although we're going to do a lot of stuff that requires those, and I'm going to kind of hand wave through it. Now, this whole tip to tail idea works real well for adding vectors, but for subtracting vectors, it's a little more confusing. And here, I'm going to switch the order because it's going to make my life easier. If you want to subtract vectors, the answer is you basically don't subtract vectors. Anytime you, anytime you want to subtract vectors, instead of subtracting it, add a negative vector. If this is my vectors A and B respectively, and if I want A minus B, I say if that's A and that's B, A minus B is the same as A plus negative B. But negative B is just B turned around 180 degrees. And so if this is A and B, A plus B would be this. A minus B would be that. Anytime you want to subtract vectors, just add by a negative vector. But here's the thing. If we're going to add or subtract vectors, that means we need to have a ruler, a protractor, and a whole bunch of these things to try to easily do it. And that's a pain in the ass. We're doing a math problem. <laughs> I went for having a piece of food in my throat to drink that water <coughs> down the long pipe. So I am feeling miserably. <coughs> yeah, sorry, a little bit of lunch in my throat. That water went down the long pipe. 
I am dying over here. Wow, I am super red on that. Okay, one second. Hang in there, Professor. Yep, I'll make it. Okay, continuing on. So, if I'm going to <laughs> if I'm going to be doing this, I don't want to have to pull out a paper and protractor and draw it out with a ruler each time. I mean, I think we can just mathematically do this all. And so to mathematically do it all, we're going to use those same trig identities we introduced in chapter one. We're going to go back to finding the components of vectors using SOKATOA. Now, we did cover SOKATOA in chapter one. The general idea is SOKATOA is a shorthand to remember that sine of an angle is opposite over hypotenuse. Cosine of an angle is adjacent over hypotenuse, and tangent of an angle is opposite over adjacent. And what that means is if you have any vector that's pointing up at some angle, is that the big one? No. If I have any vector that's pointing up at some angle, instead of saying this vector, it is this length at this angle, you can break it into components. The components of a vector are just saying, hey, this is our coordinate system. We got x, we got y. This vector is some going over in x, it's going up in y. But instead of saying that, we can say that vector is the same as two vectors added together. One vector straight along x, one vector straight along y. And I can say this guy accomplishes the same thing as those two added together. And that's what vector components are. Vector components is what vector along x plus what vector along y leads you to the thing you actually care about. And that's how we're going to actually deal with vectors. We're going to break two components. That if I tell you we got something five meters long at 30 degrees, we're going to say, fuck that noise. How far does it go in x? How far does it go in y? And use that instead. If you want to find rectangular components of a vector using SOKATOA, we can say that for any vector, the y component, which I'll put this back here a second, the y component here being this guy is going to be the magnitude of this angle times the sine, sorry, the magnitude of that vector times the sine of the angle. And the x component being this one, will be the magnitude of that vector, or magnitude of the vector times the cosine of the angle. And that we can, if I give you this vector, its magnitude and direction, you can get its x and y component. Now, a few things here. First off, this assumes your angle is measured from the horizontal. If your angle isn't measured from the horizontal, fix that. But this is how we'll take a vector magnitude and direction and break it to x and y components, which, as I said, we talked about earlier. Also, I'm using a here to represent vector. Uh, this, these equations can be used for a lot of things. They can be used for any vector notation. So I might say the x component and y component of a velocity is vx and vy, where vx equals v cosine theta. I might say the x and y component of acceleration is ax, like I have here, where ax equals a cosine, ay equals a sine. Well, what should we do forces? I'll do the same with forces. These equations can work for any vector, with this A being replaced to the appropriate symbol. We can, as we covered in chapter one, go the opposite direction. That if you know the x and y component, we can, if we know the x and y component, like so, we can find the magnitude and direction by using Pythagorean theorem and the inverse tangent. And I do want to stress, this is assuming that we are always measuring our angle from the horizontal. OK, any questions, though? You know what? I just thought of how I should do this. I'm going to try something. Aha, now I don't have to keep switching things out. I can just do that. You don't need to see me. Yeah. Probably good you can see me. I do things sometimes. OK, so let's go back to the addition of vectors. Let's say I want to add two vectors. I could draw them tip to tail. That's the actual addition. But here's the thing. If I have these two vectors, and here they're drawn 
as a vector A horizontal and a vector B up at some angle. And I can say that vector B at this angle, that vector B at that angle is really two vectors, a component in X and a component in Y, right? And so I can say if I want to add these two vectors, that will be the same as adding these three vectors or everything straight along X or straight along Y. Mathematically, if you want to add two vectors, what you're going to do is you're going to find the X component of each vector and then find the Y component of each vector. And the X component of your resultant will be the sum of X components. The Y component of your resultant will be the sum of Y components. And so, yeah, if I want to find the addition of vector A and vector B as drawn here, I'd say, okay, Vector A is at zero degrees. Vector B is at some unknown angle. And I'd say the X component of my resultant will be A cosine of theta A plus B cosine theta B. My Y component of my resultant would be A sine theta A plus B sine theta B. And that'll give me the X and Y component of my resultant. That's how I'll add them. Now, mathematically, we want to work in X and Y components. But in the real world, people don't work that way. In the real world, people say how far in what direction. And so if you get the X and Y component of the resultant, you might need to shift it back to magnitude and direction. Any questions? Successfully drank water that time. So little things that keep me going. Okay. So a few notes here. First off, this standard that X is horizontal, Y is vertical. It's just a standard. There's nothing change. There's nothing that's saying that the coordinate system can't be this. And in fact, sometimes it will be. Sometimes we will take our coordinate system and tone it or tilt it. That's fine. I'm going to almost always do, except for one exception, which will be in chapter four. Uh, I'm going to almost always do, though, X is horizontal, Y is vertical. But I mean, you could do this. So I'm saying you can't. You can spin this however you want. What is up is kind of relative. OK. OK, let's see if this is making any sense. Question for you guys. Uh, nope, that's not what I want. That's what I want. Vector A is three meters long. Vector B is four meters long. The length of the sum of the vectors must be one is seven meters, two is five meters, three is 12 meters, and four is somewhere in between. Let's see, I put up a poll to see if you guys can vote on it. For those of you who are watching this on YouTube, think of the answer yourself as you're waiting. Fifty five percent of you had voted. The forty five percent of you who didn't vote. Oh, you have to hold on more. I'm going to stop because it's a minute. So most of you said vector three, the three and four respectively, the sum must be uh, seven meters. But that's not the right answer. The answer is full. And the reason why is let's say these are my two my two vectors, right? If they're pointing in the same direction, that's seven meters. If they're pointing in the opposite direction, that's only one meter. And if they're pointing anywhere in between, whoop, that'll be something in between. 
we can't know the length of a vector three plus vector four unless you know the directions. You have to have the directions. OK. Let's do an example problem. A bird flies 100 meters due east from a tree and then 200 meters northwest, that being 45 degrees north of west. What's the bird's net displacement and angle? So let's draw it. I'm going to say north is on y and east is on x, just because it kind of matches the standard. And we're going to say the bird first flies 100 meters due east, so at zero degrees. And then it goes 200 meters at 135 degrees. Now, some of you are probably saying, where the fuck did he just get 135? But here's the thing, is I said it was 45 degrees north of west. We like traditionally to measure our angle from the x-axis. And I can say this whole bit here is 180 degrees. And 180 minus 45, that's this little bit here. That's 135. So that's how I got 135. I could have also just said 45 and remembered my x component was negative. But I found it easier just to switch to that angle. That if this is 45, measuring from the x-axis is 135. If I want to say what is the net displacement, I'm just going to add these two vectors. I'm going to say what is vector A plus vector B. And to add the two vectors, I need to break the components. So for vector A, I would say, OK, the, the vector A, 100 meters at 0 degrees. That's actually useless information. I'm going to say, what is its x and y components? And I would say, OK, the x component of A is A cosine theta, or 100 meters cosine 0. The y component of A is A sine theta, or 100 meters sine of 0. Um, cosine of 0 degrees is 1. So 100 meters times 1 is 100 meters. And the sine of 0 is 0. And so I can say my x component is 100 meters. My y component is 0 meters. Now, I debatably didn't need to do this here. It was straight along x. It was all in x. It was kind of obvious. But now I have that broken into components. What I'll do is I'll put that information to the side. And I'll say, now that I have vector A, let's do vector B. That vector B will have an x component and a y component. Well, the x component is the magnitude cosine of the angle. The y component is the magnitude sine of the angle. Uh, cosine of 135 is negative 0.707, or the square, negative square root of 2 over 2. The side of 135 is positive square root of 2 over 2. And I get my x and y component, respectively. Now, it's of note I got a negative x component, but that makes sense. Look at it. It's going up and to the left. To the left is negative. My x component is negative. It's logical. And I'll say, OK, that is my B components. Sorry, that's my X and Y components of B. I misspoke. And I can say that I just bring that up to the side and say, that's my X components and my Y components. My resultant vector, I'll find them by adding my components. My resultant vector in X is AX plus BX, 100 meters plus negative 141.4 which is negative 41.4 meters. My resultant vector in y is a y plus b y, 0 plus 141.4, which is 141.4. And that is my x and y components of my resultant vector. Now, if I want the net displacement and angle, I'm going to say I got an x and y component. Cool. Let's go back to magnitude and direction. See, I can say magnitude, Pythagorean theorem. It will be the a squared plus b squared equals c squared is the same as all x squared plus all y squared equals all squared. Or square rooting both sides. All is the square root of all x squared plus all y squared. And I'll plug in my numbers. Square. And real quick thing, very, very, very common mistake. When you put this in the calculator, if you have a negative here, make sure the negative gets squared too. If you just type this in a calculator blindly, if I just type negative 141, I'm not going to bother with the thing. Um, hold on. 
If I just type in negative 141 squared, it gave me this number. That's because it didn't square the negative sign. If I put parentheses on that negative 141, I get the positive number. When doing this, make sure the negative sign gets squared too. Because anytime you square a negative number, it's a positive number. But I square them, I add them together, I square root, and that's the magnitude. This bird traveled 147.3 meters, or that's its displacement at least. Its distance it traveled was 300 meters, but its displacement was 147.3 meters. As for its direction of its displacement, for the direction, I need to find this angle here. And I'll say that the, the, the angle is the inverse tangent of y over x. The inverse tangent of 141.4 divided by negative 41.4. Inverse tangent of this, and there's my angle. Which is actually the wrong answer. That, that's, that's not the right answer. Because let's, let's think about this. Negative 73.68, traditionally we measure the angles going counterclockwise. And so 73.68 would be up to like here. Negative 73.68 is going down to there. This goes back to something I said before. Any time your x component is negative, you got to add 180 to the answer. You don't add 180 to the x component. You do not add 180 to the y component. You get the answer, and then you add 180. And so the actual angle is 106.3 degrees. And so the displacement is 147.3 meters at 106.3 degrees. Questions? Okay, that was just math. There was no physics in yet, but that's just the pure math. Now that we know the math, let's use it to describe the physics. See, what I said we were gonna do this chapter was describe two-dimensional motion. In one-dimensional motion, we have our three kinematics equations, right? X equals X naught plus V naught T plus one half AT squared, V equals V naught plus AT, V squared equals V naught squared plus two A X minus X naught. And they were nice and simple in straight lines. We could either work in X or work in Y. But now we're gonna work up at angles. If you're still working at angles, these equations still work. However, each piece is a vector. That, and normally when you symbolize the vector, you put an arrow above it. Um, you, I'm not too religious about doing this because most of the time I break everything in the components and you don't have to do it for components. But if I want to use these, I have to say the x vector equals the x naught vector plus the v naught vector times time plus the one half acceleration vector times time squared. And if it happens to be that like, if it happens to be that like x is this way, a is this way, and V naught is that way. I'm just putting them in random directions. That's going to be a real pain in the ass. Because if it happens to be like that, what I'm going to have to do is I'm going to have to go and do all that vector algebra to each piece individually. That if the vector X, the vector V, and the vector A don't point the same way, it gets complicated. We didn't deal with this last chapter because everything was one dimensional. Everything was this way or this way or this or this. We never had to deal with what happens when they're at different angles relative to each other. And so we have to think of it more complicated. So what we're going to do is we're going to say, you know what, that whole component idea that this vector is really two. Sorry, let's switch to this one. This vector is really two vectors, an x component and a y component, which I said them in opposite order, an x, x component and a y component, we're doing in the correct order. I can choose my kinematics equations like that. What I'm going to do is I'm going to define my axes. 
I'm going to define which way is X, which way is Y. Traditionally, X is horizontal, Y is vertical. And I'm going to say, if we have two dimensional, instead of saying, hey, let's do crazy vectors, say these three equations in two dimensions aren't three equations. They're actually six. What I'm going to do is I'm going to say, if I have something moving through the air, what is the ball notice? And it's arcing around, right, from hand to hand. I'm going to say, really, that's two things happening at once. That this arcing through is the same as it going straight across while moving up and down. And I'm going to describe, OK, Hulk throwing a tank here. I'm going to say, as Hulk throws this tank, two things happen. That's going to be my tank right now. The tank is just an empty circle meant to do a full one. That's my tank. I'm going to say as Hulk throws this tank, two things happen. It goes straight up and straight down. At the same time, moves across. I'm not going to talk about it ever going up at an angle. I'm going to just say straight up and straight down and across and break it up like that. And say that my six, three equations become these six, where I add a whole bunch of subscripts. That instead of V naught and A, I have V naught X and A X, and V naught Y and A Y. Well, everything with a Y subscript is in the Y component, and everything in the X subscript is in the X component. And I'll just treat them all separately. And so my kinematics equations, I'm just going to add a shit ton of subscripts to them all. And if you say V naught, I'm going to say which one? Is it an X? Is it an Y? Maybe it has components in each. And every single vector, I will break the components. If I say V naught, if you tell me V naught is up at an angle like, like this, I'll say, I don't care about your V-naught. If this is your V-naught, I'll say, I don't care about that V-naught. What I want to know is, what is V-naught X? What is V-naught Y? And I'm going to take that V-naught and turn it into two different vectors. One to work in X, one to work in Y. The crazy thing is that this works. Let's say I have two balls. One I'm going to drop straight down. One, no initial velocity in X. No initial velocity in X just dropped. Oh, am I getting ahead of myself? A little bit, but. The other one is going to be fired horizontally, perfectly horizontally. So it has initial velocity in X, but no initial velocity in Y. The equation that describes their height is this kinematic equation. If they both have the same initial velocity in y and the same acceleration y, which is going to be negative 9.81 meters per second squared, they will both fall at the exact same rate. That this setup, that is what that's going to do. It's going to, this spring is set up so there's a ball on this end that when this is launched, it's going to fall straight down. And it's going to go across and hit this yellow ball. It's going to shoot it straight out with no initial velocity in Y, only in X. And when both are fired in slow-mo, they hit the ground perfectly in unison. Even though one is going, oh, that's way too far back. Even though one is going horizontally and one was dropped straight down, okay, now I'm just stuck in loading hell. They fall at the exact same time because their motion in Y is the same. In fact, the only link between X and Y, that if something is floating through the air, the only thing that compares the two is actually time. That if I say this yellow ball, where is it that moment in time? I can say that at that moment in time, the only link between my two sets of equations is T. That at that moment in time, if it's two seconds in, that's two seconds in. Well, my X and Y equations are completely uncoupled from each other and can be treated as separate entities. Now, 
And what has to be one of the most dangerous things for me to do when I post these classes to YouTube? Let's talk Mythbusters. Um, fun fact, this video is going to be banned in the country of Turkey, because whenever I do this video, that happens, but only Turkey, so I don't care. Mythbusters tested this. They felt they took a handgun bullet and found how long it would take the bullet just to arc to the ground naturally, just because it's falling. And they did an airplane hangle, and they made a whole setup so that the second the trigger was pulled, one bullet was dropped, while another one was fired. And they tried to work out how the time it took them to hit the ground. And now what we are saying here is that if it's fired, one bullet's fired perfectly horizontally and one is dropped, they should both hit the ground at the exact same time. Bullet dropped versus fired. In three, two, one. Sixty feet away, the boys can't see exactly where the fired bullet landed. Let's go zero ahead. So Adam takes a one-wheeled ride down the room to check out the drop zone. <laughs> wow! And the results are simply ripping. The bad can't puns all bad. Oh. I can't wait to see the high speed. Oh, dude, this bullet carved a streak right under the drop zone. <laughs> I think this might be the shot we've been looking for. In real time, it's impossible to tell what happened until Adam analyzes the high speed and crunches the numbers. 3677 minus 3915 equals 238 divided by 6. <laughs> Dude, the difference is 39.6 milliseconds which means it's less than the human eye can make out. So after days of brain-teasing tests, the Mythbusters can claim a world first for themselves. And a victory for physics. Let me put 39.6 milliseconds into some perspective for you. When you go to the movies and watch a projected celluloid film on the screen, you know that that film's made up of individual images, right? What you might not have known is that it takes 24 of those per second to make up the film that you're watching. So each one is on screen for exactly 1 24th of a second, but you don't notice that because it's faster than your eye can register. Well, that 1 24th of a second is actually longer than 39.6 milliseconds. That's how close those two bullets were. Two bullets? Which I'm just going to cut them off there. That's actually small enough that with the distance that could be accounted for for how long it would take the electrical impulse to travel down the wire. So they don't actually work that out. And that's the idea. X and Y are separate. And we have to keep them so. Okay. Now for the most part, when we talk about two dimensional motion, what we normally talk about are things flung through the air. I have this, I think I pulled him out in class once before, but this monkey with elastic arms, that if I shoot him and he go pew, which most of the time he was off the camera, he'll arc through the air. And as he arcs through the air, he is a special type of two-dimensional motion. His leg is coming off. A special type called projectile motion. Projectile motion is two-dimensional kinematics for anything that is launched through the air, anything that is fired. That bullet, this monkey being launched up at an angle, you throw a football, you hit a baseball, anytime something is going, me just doing this, that's projectile motion. In projectile motion, anything flying through the air, while it's flying through the air, has no acceleration in X that the only acceleration it feels is the acceleration due to gravity, which is in the negative y direction. That a of x will be zero, and a of y will have a magnitude of 9.81 meters per second squared. But keep in mind, a of y is downwards. So a of y has a value of negative 9.81 meters per second squared. But in this, a of x will be zero. Now, I'm going to make two assumptions here. 
really a of x shouldn't actually be zero because of air resistance. But we're going to ignore two things, or two assumptions. The first assumption we're going to make is that we're going to ignore air resistance. We're just going to pretend it doesn't exist. The second thing is we're going to ignore the rotation of the Earth. If we ignore the rotation of the Earth, because it's the rotation of the Earth will be negligible in this, and ignore, ignore air resistance because it's normally negligible, we can say anything flying through the air will make a perfect parabolic path due to the negative acceleration in y and the zero acceleration in x. And you can actually see this. This GIF, which I'll show you another version, is a truck traveling at constant velocity as they have this guy jumping in the trampoline or a tractor traveling at constant velocity. The person stays above the trampoline. The person stays above the trampoline because their motion in X is uncoupled. That they're moving in projectile motion arcing through the air. We don't know it as an arc. To us, it looks like straight up and straight down because the cam was moving with it. But the X is not part of it. To see that heel, this I have a ping pong ball in this launcher. And what happens is when this thing moves past this right here, it's going to launch a ball straight up. Initial velocity in Y. And this coat is nearly frictionless. So the coat is going to have an initial velocity in X. But there's going to be no acceleration in X on the coat because it's nearly frictionless. The ball is going to go up in the air. The ball is going to have no acceleration in X because it's in projectile motion. And as long as the ball has no acceleration in X, it should stay with the coat. Because as I said, the coat has no acceleration in X either. And so what happens when this fires is the ball stays directly above the coat. It lands back in the coat. It perfectly keeps up with it. Because in the air, there's no acceleration in X. And yes, it might go up and down. There's an acceleration in Y. The acceleration in Y is unrelated. And if I was to plot the height of that ping pong ball, or in this case, this guy, I would say his position in Y went up and down. His position in X just moved steadily across. And if I was to find the slope of these, I get velocity, I'd see my velocity in X is constant. My velocity in Y is changing at a rate of g. And what this does is those earlier six equations I had, my six equations that was just my kinematics equations twice, they simplify. Because if all of my x equations, a of x is 0, and so x equals x naught plus v naught xt plus 1 half at squared becomes x equals x naught plus v naught t. The 1 half at squared disappears because a is 0. My vx equals v naught x minus, oh, sorry, my vx equals v naught x plus at just becomes vx equals v naught x because a is zero. And so these equations really become these five that my equations in y are the, my equations in y are the exact same as the free fall equations. They're identical. And my equation in x is just that as if it's, well, it's just as if there's like no acceleration in x, because there is none. Also, I always define x naught as 0. And since I always define x naught as 0, I can simplify these further, because I can say this x naught term, oops, this x naught term right here, I can say that goes away. And so these would be my equations. But here's the thing. If we have our initial conditions, we normally would say, OK, like, take this monkey again. If I'm going to launch this monkey, I'm going to go and launch it up at an angle. And I can say, OK, I launch it at this angle, this hold. I don't say I launch it this hold horizontally. And I launch it this hold upwards. I say, hey, up at that angle, go. I really should look before I file, before I knock things over. We don't think in X and Y components. We need to say not. No one's going to say they threw a ball this hold in X, this hold in Y. They'll say, hey, they hit that at 20 degrees, this hold. 
And so when you do these problems, V naught X and V naught Y is basically Neville given. What you're given is V naught. When you solve these problems, V naught X and V naught Y are normally not given. The magnitude of V naught and the angle of theta. But if I give you the magnitude of V naught and the angle it was launched at, that's that Sokotoa we started on. V naught Y is V naught sine theta. V naught X is V naught cosine theta. And so if I'm given a problem, I'll tell you how hard something or how fast something was launched at what angle. You will first need to find the X component and the Y component of V naught. Anytime you're given V naught, say, fuck that noise. I don't give a shit about V naught. What is V naught X? What is V naught Y? And once you have V naught X, and once you have V naught Y, then say, okay, I know V naught X, I know V naught Y. Now we can go and plug into these equations. And I'm going to add one more thing here. For a traditional projectile motion problem, and the ones you're going to get on the homework, the ones you're going to get on the exam, and two of the three examples I'm going to do in class on Wednesday will be traditional ones. I have only ever written one problem that what I'm about to say isn't true. And it's one in the lecture notes that I'm going to introduce as not true. But for a traditional problem, you only need this and this. For a traditional problem, you never solve for velocity. And if you never solve for velocity, you don't need those V equations. The other equations are only useful to solve V. And you normally don't do that. And so normally it's going to be find the X component of velocity, find the Y component of velocity, and use those top two equations to solve. Now, let's see, how many I got? Three minutes? I can wrap up a little more. So, if you launch something projectile motion, um, if I throw something straight up, straight down, right? What's the velocity of something at the highest point if I throw it straight up and straight down? Anyone? Zero. Zero. If I fire a projectile motion, that's not true. If I fire something in projectile motion at the highest point, the Y component of velocity is zero at the highest point. VY will still be zero at the highest point, but VX is whatever the fuck VX is. It won't change. In fact, if you want to find the highest point, you won't pay any attention to X. If you want to find the highest point, you'll just say this is exactly the same as free fall. X has no part in it. We'll just say VY equals zero, and that's how we can find for the highest point. What is more common is someone will launch something and they'll say, OK, I'm going to like, you know, where can I, I see that pillow? I'm going to line this up. I'm going to put it at some angle. I'm going to go to something and I'm going to shoot it over to that distance. Is that the pillow you could see? Yep, that was the pillow you could see. What's more likely is someone says, how far does it get? If I launch this, what the range it travels? How far can it go? That's more likely for what people want to solve. If you ever want to find the range, what range is? Range is how far does something move in X before it hits the ground? If you want to find the range, what you do is you start by finding the time something is in the air. Because that is when it hits, when it hits the ground, that's how far it got. And so you say, use your Y equation. Use your Y equation to solve for T. If you use your Y equation to solve for T, you know how long something's in the air. Once you know how long it's in the air, you can figure out how far it traveled in X. And that's the common problems we're going to solve. I'm either going to give you a range in X and ask for a height Y, or I'm going to give you a height Y and ask for a range in X. And the link is time. Nobody can use just these two equations and use one to solve for T and to plug into the other one. Now, examples of doing problems like that is going to have to wait till Wednesday. Because we are out of time. But on Wednesday, I will do two traditional problems like this and one less traditional. And we're going to do it all through the lens of bad 80s, 90s, 90s? I don't know. 
bad old action movies. But that's for next time. I'm going to stop there unless there's any questions. Okay, I'm going to stop there. Have a good day. I'll see you all Wednesday. Well, I'll talk to you Wednesday. I don't see anyone ever, but I'll just stop it.